Recent elections, most notably that of Donald Trump as US president, have highlighted the dangers to democracy posed by those using social media and the internet to spread malicious propaganda and fake news. So how and why are platforms such as Facebook, Google and Twitter so wide open to abuse? In a two-part special report, we sent Bob Abe's house to investigate. San Francisco and Silicon Valley tech companies driving the digital revolution see themselves as positive agents of political and social change. Facebook's mission is all about giving people a voice and bringing people closer together. Those are democratic values and we're proud of them. Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. The more you learn about technology, the more you learn what's possible. At Twitter, our canvas is communication. If we want to see democracy, it's up to us to make sure that we empower by giving people better tools. But Russia's manipulation of these platforms during the 2016 U.S. presidential election has raised fundamental questions about their systemic vulnerabilities. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth? The whole Last truth November, the, the companies truth. were summoned to appear before the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee. The threat is not new. Russians have been conducting information warfare for decades. But what is new is the advent of social media tools with the power to magnify propaganda and fake news on a scale that was unimaginable back in the days of the Berlin Wall. You've created these platforms, and now they are being misused. And you have to be the ones to do something about it, or we will. What you're doing by allowing this fake stuff to come across, this misleading, this damaging information is threatening the security and really the sovereignty of our nation. I wish that your CEOs would be here. They need to ask, answer for this. After repeated pressure from Congress, Facebook disclosed last September that 470 fake accounts linked to a shadowy company with ties to the Kremlin, the Internet Research Agency, had spent some $100,000 to purchase more than 3,000 ads, most on divisive hot-button issues. This account promoted a pro-Texas causes and included posts. Many would characterize as anti-immigration or anti-Muslim. The Russian-sponsored Facebook page, Heart of Texas, attracted nearly 254,000 followers. The Heart of Texas group created a public event on Facebook to occur at the Islamic Center in Houston, Texas, to stop the Islamization of Texas. Russian operatives also created a page for United Muslims of America, a real group whose name they commandeer to promote a counter-protest at the Islamic Center. What neither side could have known is that Russia trolls were encouraging both sides to battle in the streets and create division between real Americans. And causing this disruptive event in Houston cost Russia about $200. The Russians created more than 100 Facebook pages to exacerbate social divisions in the U.S. There were pages for African-American groups and police advocates, Southern nationalists and liberal activists, LGBT supporters and Christian fundamentalists. Army of Jesus and other Russian pages ran anti-Hillary Clinton ads during the election. Each of these fake accounts spend literally months developing networks of real people to follow and like their content. These networks are later utilized push an array of disinformation. The day before the hearing, Facebook revealed that Russian content reached as many as 126 million Americans. Twitter found more than 36,000 Russian accounts that generated 1.4 million election-related tweets seen almost 300 million times. And Google disclosed that Russian trolls likely posted 1,100 videos on 18 YouTube channels. This is a yes or no question. Do you believe that any of your companies have identified the full scope of Russian active measures on your platform. Senator, our, our investigation continues. So I would have to say no, certainly not with certainty. Mr. Regent? No, and we're, we're still working on this. Mr. Walker? I believe we have done a comprehensive investigation, but these are ongoing issues and we continue to investigate. 
we are relying on Twitter, Facebook, and Google to find and reveal this information. And it's been dripping out. So uh, I think we have a long way to go before we know the full story. Siva Vaidyanathan is director of the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. The author of The Googleization of Everything, his new book, Anti-Social Media, will be released this year. Russian interference is alarming, but the biggest effect that social media have on the prospect of democracy um, has to do with undermining our ability as citizens to think and act uh, effectively and collectively. Why do you think the world is in the midst of an internet assault on democracy? Since 2011, what we have seen is the rise of authoritarian leaders, often elected in places like Poland, like Hungary, like India, like the Philippines. Google and Facebook and Twitter have all been used by these forces. And then in my own country, Donald Trump laid almost all of his hopes on a Facebook-based campaign. By late 2017, Facebook reached almost 2.2 billion people. That's stunning. And if you were to design a communicative system, a propaganda system for nationalist forces, for anti-Muslim forces, for authoritarian forces, you could not build a better platform than Facebook. We set out to investigate why Facebook, Twitter, and Google are such powerful tools for malicious actors who want to spread disinformation and undermine people's faith in democracy. The first stop was in Silicon Valley to meet with the co-founders of Blitz Metrics, Dennis Yu and Logan Young. They teach social media marketing and run advertising campaigns on Facebook for the NBA champ Golden State Warriors and more than 100 other clients. Facebook is the world's most powerful and sophisticated targeting platform. It is a database instead of a social network. Facebook sorts its users' characteristics into hundreds of categories, making it easy for advertisers to target people with great precision. And you don't have to be a statistics expert. You can just click on a few buttons and the system will do the work for you. In 2016, the Trump campaign spent most of its $100 million digital advertising budget on Facebook. Yu and Young demonstrated how Facebook could have been used to reach blue-collar workers in Michigan, a state that usually goes Democratic, but that Trump won by less than 11,000 votes. I can do based off income, you know, if I know the average blue-collar worker makes 50 to 100K, so I could say people that are conservative or very conservative. They could be AFL-CIO members. They could be against, you know, immigration. There's all these other issues that we can bucket in here. We could even put in labor union or the United Auto Workers, right? If you have the kind of content that's directly relevant to that particular group, such as the U.S. auto industry isn't as strong as it used to be. So this is data that Facebook has brought together from many different sources, not just their platform. That's right. We have this information of your membership. We have your zip data. We have if you've made that donation. We know the kinds of products that you're buying in the supermarket. Everything that you're doing that doesn't involve cash usually makes its way to Facebook. But the most powerful capability Facebook provides comes from combining its data with that of advertisers themselves. So think about the Trump campaign. They have all of the information of the people that are making donations. They upload that to Facebook. Then Facebook can say, I'm going to find friends of people that have donated. And then I could combine that with the other data that we're showing and say, how many of those people are also in Michigan and are also over 35 and are also working in Detroit and are you know, laid off at the Ford plant? And you can also test the messages that work most effectively with that group. Yes. And you can spend just pennies to be able to see how they're working. And they showed how a small amount of money spent promoting a client's video resulted in millions of views. And I can see here we spent $506, and for that we got a reach of 94,000. 94,000 times it showed up on someone's feed, but it has over 29 million views. And the reason is these shares. This has been shared 422,000 times. So really what you want to do when you buy ads is generate shares. That's exactly it. The Russians were really good at pushing incendiary content that people will just have to engage and have to share. The Russians' divisive content may have reached 126 million Americans on Facebook, according to the company. But you points out the ads were seen over and over again by the same people, appearing on news feeds hundreds of millions of times. And do you think that these hundreds of millions of impressions that they got had a real impact? Maybe, maybe not. Was it in Michigan or Florida or places that were close? I don't really know. But what I do know 
is that they're saying how effective Facebook is and how we can micro-target and how it's great for advertisers that are selling furniture and cars, yet at the same time, you don't think that 100 million impressions on Facebook can't create an, an impact on an election? Like, you, you can't have that both ways, right? So of course Facebook can influence an election. In fact, we used to joke about how you'd throw an election uh, using various tools at Facebook, which Facebook absolutely could do. Antonio Garcia Martinez worked at Facebook from 2011 to 2013 and played a central role in developing Facebook's micro-targeting system. My responsibility there was uh, product manager for ads targeting, which meant basically turning uh, all your user data into money for Facebook. Effectively. What role do you think Facebook played in Donald Trump's election? Oh, huge. I mean, political pundits get things wrong all the time, right? But a well-trained machine learning algorithm trained on good data doesn't often come up with the wrong answer, right? And I spent years building tools to basically defeat human reason or human or, you know, dominate human taste. It's, it's, it's very weird. But don't you think that can be a real problem when used to sell political candidates and their messages rather than consumer products? Right. No, I think politics are somewhat different, right? At the end of the day, our democracy and our political system depends on it, and that's frankly more important than selling a pair of shoes, like no question, right? But Martinez is much more concerned about the way Facebook encourages people to live inside their own echo chamber, what's also called a filter bubble. To me, the bigger issue that I really don't see a solution for is the sort of filter bubble slash fake news problem, right? Where, you know, citizens used to have a right to an opinion, and now they have a right to their own reality. You know, Facebook flatters their vision of the world, and they're never forced to challenge their assumptions. You know, they can go off in some rabbit hole of untruth. Facebook's mission is to give people what they want on their newsfeed. An executive providing orientation drove that message home to Martinez on his first day of work. He had this very sweeping vision of, you know, the New York Times of you. In fact, he asked it in the form of a question. He's like, oh, what is Facebook? You know, and some dumb intern said, oh, it's a social network. He's like, no, wrong, right? It is your personalized newspaper. They basically feed you anything that you engage with. By engage means likes, comments, share, etc. Like, their, their newsfeed algorithm is optimized to that. Facebook recently announced changes to its newsfeed that will prioritize posts from friends and news from sites that users rate as trustworthy. But the changes could reinforce filter bubbles and do little to stem the spread of bogus news. Why is it so easy to disseminate fake news on Facebook? Well, again, I think it, it all comes down to, you know, what psychologists call cognitive dissonance, right? Views of the world that flatter your worldview, you just eat up like candy or french fries and you just can't get enough of it. And, and that's, that's why fake news is so effective, because it's the world as you'd like to see it rather than it actually is. Today, more than two-thirds of Americans get news on social media. Do you think Facebook has contributed to the polarization oh, yeah, in America totally, yeah, today? Yeah, yeah, but I don't think anyone had any notion that it would reach the levels where it's reached today in which you have democracies that basically can't function, right? I mean, you can't have democracy in which you and I can't agree on a ground truth of values and realities. If, if we don't have that, then how do we form consensus around a policy goal? How do we solve any of society's problems, right? Information bubbles exist, but the breadth of information that an average person today holds is the largest in history. Michal Kozinski is a psychologist at Stanford who did path-breaking research on what you can tell about people from Facebook likes. We just look at likes that people have, not we actually, the algorithm can take likes from your profile, your Facebook profile, and would be able to very accurately reveal your psychological traits, your political views, your sexual orientation, your um, ethnicity, um, whether you take drugs or not, and a number of other sensitive and intimate uh, things. Kosinski thinks the upside of using these new psychographic profiling techniques in politics far outweighs the downside. Making it possible for politicians to adjust their message in such a way as to make it relevant to people, it's great because it increases engagement of people in politics. It's great for the democracy. But people can be... Uh engaged because of very narrow issues. And engagement within a narrow political point of view is not necessarily good for democracy, is it? Social networks are a great advantage, a great boon to the democracy. Anyone can become a blogger. Anyone can become a publisher. Well, on one hand, it brings us all of those people that say not real things. But on the other hand, it protects us from governments or powerful individuals or corporations dominating the communication channels. But the algorithms are channeling to you the things you really want to see. 
So, in some sense, it undermines any sense of truth or a common reality in which people can talk and try to work out policy together, no? There is data that exists that shows that humans always, this is just human nature, we always occupied our own echo chambers. We always occupy the universe of me. Now, today, thanks to recommendation systems, those universes of us, of me and you, are the largest universes we ever had and they're also overlapping to a great extent. I think the effect of the filter bubble has yet to be quantified and I'm willing to render a hypothesis that when we get a decent full assessment of the effect of filter bubbles it will be different among different groups and different people. How have social media platforms affected political discourse? Social media platforms have divided us have made us shallower. You know, the very addictive nature of it interferes with our ability to dive deeply into long texts. It interferes with our ability to speak face to face at any depth with people and perhaps to come to some sort of you know, mutual awareness or agreement. You know, it, it does structure our habits and thoughts in ways that are not healthy for living life in a complex world and living in a democracy. Do you think that the spread of junk news and disinformation on social media platforms has undermined truth in a sense? If you're reading and learning about the world through Facebook, what you're getting is a mixture of traditional quality journalism and completely out there, completely made up stories that look like journalism. You're going to have a really hard time distinguishing what is true and what is not. And if you are of the mind that you would like to undermine our ability to think about facts and coherently argue about policy, you're going to turn to social media to get your word out there, to mess with people, to frustrate people, to confuse people. Because nothing better has ever been invented. Larry Kim, an online marketing consultant, showed us just how easy it is to spread disinformation on Facebook. He was troubled by all the fake news sites that popped up during the 2016 presidential election. Last October, he ran a test to see if Facebook had addressed the problem. He took us through the steps of his experiment. I wanted to know if, if uh, Facebook had closed the loopholes, uh, and the whole effort took less than an hour. So the first thing that I did was create a fake news website, basically, to disseminate fake stories. So my blog, I, I decided to, to go with the name Citizens News Networks. The story that I used was actually a very famous fake story about a Donald Trump protester who is saying that he was paid $3,500 to protest a Trump rally. That was from the election, right? Yeah, you can see, Bob, this is a really ridiculous looking site. It doesn't seem very authoritative in, in any way. I did this intentionally because I wanted to see will the Facebook kind of fake news police, you know, be able to kind of catch this, this, little, uh, this little hack in, in the act. Then what did you do? Well, so uh, the next thing you need to do is set up a Facebook page uh, for my fake website. And that's really easy to do. Uh, and it takes, you know, one or two minutes. So if you want to promote a fake news site on Facebook, they don't check it all when you sign up? <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely, they don't check. I, I was claiming to be a, a media outlet, but uh, you know, that, that was all self-declared information. And then I just simply shared the fake news article to my fake news Facebook page. Uh, and now we're almost in business here. Uh, you know, step three, we need, just need to promote this story uh, to, to an audience, uh, you know, using Facebook ads. To boost exposure of his fake article on Facebook news feeds, Kim spent $53 on a so-called engagement ad. For his experiment, he targeted people in three swing states key to Trump's victory, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. I went with a demographic that is very, very likely to, to eat this stuff up. So, for example, people who are Republicans, who are members of the National Rifle Association, people who donate to conservative causes. After he selected the groups he wanted to target, he clicked on the Boost Post button. You know, I just want to get caught. I want somebody at Facebook to shut this down and say, like, you know, this is the violation of, of some term. But keep in mind, Facebook is an is a advertising business, and, and the ad was approved within minutes. So what happened? Did you immediately start getting people posting to it or reacting to it? 
The reaction was bonkers. Like people were clicking on it and commenting on it and sharing on it and liking it like crazy. Within an hour, about 5,000 people saw it for, for 50 bucks. That doesn't happen that often, you know? I, I have companies that are spending orders of magnitude more than, than, than 50 bucks uh, and, and they can't drive this type of engagement. What did you take away from doing this experiment? My takeaway is this is appalling that, that fake news threatens to undermine our systems of government. So it's very concerning that you know people can still do this a year later after the, after the election. What do you think can be done to address this problem? Pretty obvious first step is there should be some kind of an application process. You know, like just like when you sign up for a credit card, that you know some kind of a validation of advertisers to verify who they are and if they are real or not. Facebook declined our request for an interview. It pains us as a company that our platform was abused in this way. People Facebook, Google, and Twitter have each announced a variety of measures to deal with disinformation. These include tweaks to algorithms, political ad disclosure, increased security staffing, and review of articles by outside fact checkers. Facebook's approach to fact checking is actually not doing well. People think that content throughout the site is being checked because they're seeing some disputed tags, um, and that's just not true. What's the focus of Robin Kaplan is a scholar at the Data and Society Research Institute. She focuses on policy to deal with disinformation and propaganda on social media platforms. Do you think Facebook, Twitter, and Google can address the problems of disinformation over their platforms without fundamentally changing their economic model? No, I don't. These are private companies, and that creates huge challenges because, firstly, they are driven by their own goals and incentives that need to align with their business model. Things like clicks, likes, and shares are the metrics that are used to prioritize or deprioritize content because that's how ad revenue is based. But those signals don't actually tell us much about whether or not that content is truthful um, or important or, or valuable. Do you think the companies can really solve a lot of the problems by tweaking their algorithms? I don't think algorithms are actually going to fix this problem. These companies need to start hiring on editorial staff and journalists, people who have been located within the traditions of news media to start informing some of the decisions that platform companies are making in reviewing content. What do you think of the company's argument that if they take a greater role in curating content, it's going to lead to censorship? We can develop processes to make sure that they are not censoring content arbitrarily. So I think we need to start having a conversation about whether or not they should be held to a higher standard of norms and values that we've had with print or radio or cable. I think it's time for platforms to step up to the plate and accept the responsibility that they're media companies, that they're not neutral technology companies. Here's the ironic thing, right? People say that Facebook has too much power, so as a reaction they want Facebook to assume more power by actually potentially censoring or editing content on their platform. As a former employee, I'm not sure that I want Facebook becoming the editor-in-chief to the world's newspapers. I'm actually not a big fan of that solution. Do you think social media platforms can deal with the problem of echo chambers and fake news without undermining their economic model? In a way, there's nothing they can do about it and be the companies they are, is that right? That, I think that's right, that's right. But one thing that might change is that I think people might get just more savvy, right? They might understand that they're looking at fake news. I mean, in some sense, look, every, every new technology is characterized by, in the initial period of discovery, being used by either criminals or rogues or, you know, or for various negative, for negative outcomes. And so I think we're going through social media's growing pains right now. It's too early to tell, but I don't think that, 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 that society adjusts to these moments. Look, in Germany in the 1930s, radio and film became powerful instruments of propaganda. They were the chosen instruments of Goebbels and of Hitler. And they worked beautifully for them after World War II. We confronted the fact that propaganda was dangerous. We had a fervent public conversation about it. We had commissions devoted to it in order to deliver solid, dependable information. And so, no, we, we haven't adjusted to the technology. We've just gotten lucky. We have managed to manage it through the use of competition, the celebration of multiple voices, and through a practice of consensus. But I fear that that consensus is breaking down. And when that consensus breaks down, the power of propaganda gets that much stronger. In the next concluding episode of this special report, how Russia and the extreme right use automated social media accounts, known as bots, 
to spread disinformation and propaganda.